morning to all of you. Please stand to your feet with us as we are going to enter in God's presence and thanksgiving and praise. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you have made. We thank you so much for your presence in this place. We thank you for your faithfulness towards us, your everlasting love, God. Thank you that your mercy today was renewed, that there is breath in our lungs, that we are able to stand here. We thank you for the power of the blood of Jesus over each one of us as we come into the light to have fellowship with you, to be cleansed, to be reminded, to be strengthened in our faith. Lord, we respond today as your church should. We respond today to give you worship, to give you praise, to give you all the glory, to refocus, God, our eyes upon you, to lift our hands unto you, to, God, express our thanksgiving unto you. We thank you that if it wasn't for you, we would not be here. We thank you, God, that our praise unto you comes, God, from the place in our life that we have been forgiven, we have been made righteous, we have been made clean and we stand here God today in your holy presence your church gives you what you are worthy of God we give you all the glory we give you all the honor we give you all the praise we give you all the worship come on church with your own words right now begin to step in to your own praise begin to step into your worship begin to thank him oh we thank you Lord oh we thank you Lord we give you praise this day. We give you worship this day. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. There is none like you. There will be none like you before today or tomorrow. That you, God, are the same. You are the same. And we thank you. Your name is worthy. Your name is worthy to be lifted up today. And we lift up your holy name in this place. We lift up your holy name in this place. Come on, let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart, I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things that he does for me. He forgives all my sins. He heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with great things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. Let us praise the Lord this morning with all that we are for all that he's done, for all that he is still to do. We thank you, Jesus. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. I'll praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered. I'll praise when surrounded. As long as I'm breathing, as long as I'm breathing. 
Victory belongs to Jesus. Victory belongs to Jesus.
mockery that took all the embarrassment so that you can live in freedom of depression freedom of hopelessness freedom living with joy behold the lamb that's come to earth to take all the sins all the iniquity what a beautiful moment it probably was. And we have that same moment here right now to behold the Lamb. To behold the Lamb, King Jesus, He is here in this place. And He is worthy of all of our worship. He is worthy of all of the praise from the depths of our hearts, from every, from the, every heart and every mind. If you came here with a question in your heart and your mind, if you came here with doubt, if you came here with a fear, let me tell you that the Lamb is here. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb that has come to earth to take all iniquity, all pain, all the sins of this world. Come on. Back then, they were waiting, but now, we know that he is here and he is here right now behold the presence of Jesus in this place Jesus we honor you we give you glory just begin to lift up the beautiful name that is Jesus with your own words begin to de declare how amazing he is and maybe that might not be a reality to you in this moment but I just want to encourage you to declare with faith the testimony, the things that He's done, or just declare the things, the breakthroughs in your life that you're wanting, that you're yearning for. He is in this place. He is close, and He is near, and as much as you want it, He wants it even more. As much as you want it, He wants it even more. The King of glory is in this place. My friends, He was buried. He was crucified as a lamb, but He is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He is lifted on high. There is nothing, there is nothing that is stronger than what He has done. There's nothing that is greater than what He has done. Come on. He holds the keys. He holds the keys to eternal life. Come on. The enemy has no hold. What He has is greater than what is stronger. We stand this morning and we believe. Can we cry out? the King of glory, all the honor, all the praise, Jesus, we honor your presence, Jesus, we honor you in this place, we don't care what it looks like, but we just thank you so much, we just thank you so much for all that you've done, for all that you've done, Jesus.
My friend, if you came through the door this morning without worship already on your lips, without already giving victory to the King of Kings and you're expecting the worship team to carry you through, let me remind you through the Word of God that the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers would have been purified once and for all, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year, for it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written about me in scriptures. And on that day, on that day, on the crucifixion, on that sacrifice, on that day that Jesus laid his life down, the veil was torn. It could no longer perform the intention that had been set for it. It could no longer perform the symbolism that was set before it, given you and I, Jew and Gentile, the ability to step into the Holy of Holies as we have the opportunity to do, to do, to do today. And by the Holy Spirit testifies this and he says, verse 19, and so dear brothers and sisters, we can now boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new curtain, opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And so we, since we have a high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our, our guilty conscience has been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean and our bodies have been washed with pure water. If you are needing a reason, let me remind you today that a new atonement has been taken place, a new covenant has taken place to replace the old. When that curtain tone, uh, tore, it has given you the ability to step in that place today. In that place, I want you, as we go back into worship, to speak that, re that restoration into your life, to claim that promise, that healing, that circumstance in your life, that family member, that may be infirmity, that may be discomfort in your body, whatever it is, as we go back into it, give him praise above that circumstance because it is given to you as a promise. It's not a suggestion. This is what God has given to us as a prescription for our life. So let's go back into it.
is worthy. Come on, give him praise. crown you with our praise all honor all power all praise Jesus receive your honor we lift your name above all else you deserve it Lord we thank you Lord we thank you for you Jesus we thank you for your obedience we thank you for being obedient to the cross we thank you for being obedient to the sacrifice Lord we thank you for the atonement, Lord. We thank you for the promises that we can stand on, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that in that particular moment, Lord, it isn't something that has to be constantly renewed, but by a single, Lord, act of obedience, God, we can stand on it in the renewal of our lives, and we thank you for it. We crown you for it, Lord. You are King of kings, and no other name above yours takes glory. We bless your mighty name, Lord. We thank you for all that you have done, Lord. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit. We thank you that you are evident here in this very service in this morning, God, and we pray, Lord, that you prepare for each and every single one of us what it is that you have that's going to speak to us, to those places that need you most, Lord, to those places that need a word, Lord, that need a touch, that need an area, Lord, of refill. We thank you that you're already here and you're working in your ministry, God. We bless your mighty, mighty name into this home that you move and you stir in a way like no other. We thank you. We thank you. And the body came together and everyone said, amen. Amen. Come on. Let's give him some praise. Let's give him some praise. Worship team. Thank you guys so, so, so much. Always incredible to do this with you this morning. While you're up and about, get out of your seats for a couple minutes. Shake a hand. Say hello to a new face. I know we had a lot of people come through the building yesterday, so I'm sure there's some people here that came through. What an incredible way to start a morning, amen? Anybody else with me? God, I was already psyched coming in this morning just having, after having been here the last couple days. Um, if you had made it over the last three days and you got a chance to come in, I am sure that you are absolutely blessed. Um, just as a recap, the journey to the cross happened this weekend. Come on. What an incredible time. I'm, guys, I'll tell you this. If you are not already finding some, some, some place to serve and you are finding this as a, as a reason to leave your children here and to get away and to do what it is that you have your schedule, I encourage you for the next event, the next function, do this as a family. Do it as a family. With their age is not a limit. We need everybody and, every, and, and anybody that is looking to volunteer that can be available. There's nothing like doing this as a family. As you guys look at the, over these, I will recap. We had over the last three days, two th mind you, this is not including 350 of our volunteers and children under seven, 2,000 people come through the door. Come on, that is a, that is a lot of people, right? 2,000 people, that's not including our very own, and that's not including kids under the age of seven. Incredible, incredible time. People were being touched. People were being encountered. Um, children were being carried out the door because it was too much for them. Um, but all, all in all, a great, great time. So as we, as we what, you know, near that next um, 
next event or whatever we have, I just want to bless you to throw your name onto that list right away. Do this as a family. Uh, as you guys can see, it was you know, incredible, incredible time. Uh, so my next announcement, uh, whip out your guys' phones. This is a really important one is Good Friday service is this coming Friday, 7 p.m., combined service. Um, be here a couple minutes earlier, so this will be between both services. Uh, and then Resurrection Sunday service, March 31st, as usual, uh, Russian service at 9 a.m., English service at 11, and then we'll have our G4T service at 6 o'clock. Uh, and then uh, a quick update on summer missions. We are going to be sending out more teams in the next couple of months to Honduras and Kenya. So if you'd like to get a little bit more information, find out a little more about it, scan the QR code, and it'll take you to a website where you can learn of it. So if, if you're needing additional info, come to one of us, and, and we'll point you in the right direction. Um, all right, let's talk, let's talk offering. I'm going to share a scripture that um, is probably one... You likely have heard or haven't heard that has to do with offering. But scripture today is John 3.30. He must become greater and greater, and I must become less and less. And my emphasis this morning on giving, when I give, isn't isn't on the giving itself, but on Christ himself. Um, Because being in him, giving becomes a byproduct Right? Um, as, as I become less of myself and I become filled with greater and greater presence of myself, uh, it becomes a byproduct of him. Jesus Christ himself defines the act of giving, the purpose of giving. If you read Hebrews 10, uh, it says the blood of the bulls and the goats wouldn't bring reconciliation, but in his blood there's atonement. Right? In his blood there's renewal. And his purpose for his entire life was knowing that he was going to sacrifice himself. He was going to give himself. He is the ultimate standard for giving. And, uh, you know, this morning as I was preparing, you know, although our intentions are pure, we tend to look at this scripture as an encounter with the Lord, maybe an infilling of the Holy Spirit, a new touch when we talk about being a greater refill. But oftentimes when it comes to our businesses, our money, our work life, maybe not so much. If the shoe fits and the circumstance works, you know, we'll, 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 we'll do it then. But the reality is that should be taking place in every part of our life. Right? If I am becoming less and he is becoming greater, that ultimately tr- pours into my giving. It pours into my acts of obedience, my sacrifices that I give. So my emphasis today isn't necessarily on tithe. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's not. My emphasis today is to redirect your gaze to the one that sets the, defini- sets the definition for giving. Because it through him, through the model of Jesus Christ is where giving comes through us. So if you're in a place where you have questions, maybe you're uncertain about giving, tithing, um, put your gaze towards him, spend time with him, and let him redirect your heart for when it comes to specifically for how much to give, what to give, what that looks like for you and your family. Um, Because ultimately, it all comes from him. Amen? If we can please, uh, ushers, if you can help me with buckets, let's bless our offering, let's bless our tithe. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the power in it, Lord. We pray for the the giftings that we've prepared, Lord, that they are given out of a heart of generosity, Lord, given out of a heart of obedience with an understanding, Lord, that you are the symbol that's the symbol that was sacrificed, Lord, that you were set before us for us to know more of you, to learn more of you, and set the standard for giving, Lord. We thank you for what you're doing this morning. We bless it, Lord. We bless the service, the word that you're preparing, and we pray in the power of your mighty name, Jesus. Amen. you this is the construction update we are full throttle into phase three and it's been something we have uh, had expectancy towards and we're so excited for it now happening this area is our old sanctuary that's being converted into a multi-use facility it'll be a gymnasium as well as a banquet hall so for weddings for our church lunches for any kind of gatherings during our conferences this is where we get to sit down have fellowship and eat food If we're eating food, then that brings us into our commercial kitchen area. You ain't gonna believe 
what this area is going to look like and you're going to be wanting to be a part of the kitchen team i know there's some guys signing up just to wash dishes on the new dish washer this area is going to be so beautiful making us able to cook food be comfortable prepare food for many many people and we're so excited about this also above the commercial kitchen is going to be our upper room yes we're going to have another upper room it's going to be also multi-use for services uh, for gatherings for events we are so excited to see this project come to completion financially kind of where we're at right now is we have about six hundred thousand dollars towards this project already three hundred thousand has already been spent and we have about three hundred thousand that we're yet to spend that we already have the expected overall budget is approximately 1.4 million which makes us about eight hundred thousand dollars shy of that full amount we want to encourage you and ask you to be involved with us not only with your hands in the work process but in prayer and also financially if you have it in your heart to give you can give through push pay you can uh, give in any service in the next three or four months we are believing to finish phase three construction and you have that time to be a part of this work however you can. We are believing, as God has brought us this far, that we are going to finish our construction in this church and we're going to pay off our building. I want to encourage you to be involved and sow a sacrificial seed to be a part of this work, to see God open doors for you, God provide for you. God maybe is going to put a number on your heart that you're going to be giving in these next few months to be a part of this work. I'm so excited to be a part of it, knowing my kids are going to be growing up here. Maybe you're going to get married in this banquet hall, but for sure playing sports in it. And I'm so excited to be a part of what God is doing here in our church. I want to encourage you to do the same. God bless you, and we're going to keep you updated with what happens next. Thank you so much. Amen. They made me do the video again. Um, I want to just encourage you and remind you uh, with what you just heard. Next Sunday when we have our Resurrection Sunday, um, Friday we'll be having our Good Friday service and on Sunday we'll be, re we'll be celebrating our Resurrection service. And on Sunday when we have it, we're going to be doing a sacrificial offering. It's kind of become a, a good tradition of ours over the years that on that Sunday we bring a special offering to the Lord and, and we, pray, we pray into this what God puts on, us, puts on our heart to do and we give that amount. You know, what I want to maybe say regarding that is um, all of us, uh, we have a tendency to get comfortable uh, as soon as we kind of have an area of our life figured out, whether it's work, whether it's finances, whether it's what we give, where we serve. But God is always calling us to live a sacrificial life. Um, you know, even just think about this weekend and what we saw happen here. <clears throat> um, if you came in last night at 11 p.m., this place was still fully set up uh, for the event. And then just in a few hours, completely tore down. And now you see what you see. Um, it'd be impossible to do what we just did without sacrifice. And I think that element of sacrifice that we see, even with Journey to the Cross or any other event we do, or when it comes to the sanctuary that we're in right now, how much sacrifice it took for us to stand here today, to be here in this beautiful sanctuary. And I think... Um, the, beauty, the beauty of God's body, the church, is that when every member obeys God and what he asks him to do, um, you don't have to give or, or, or provide the same amount of sacrifice that your neighbor does. You just have to do what God's asking you to do. And what's amazing is when you, when you watch the body of Christ obey the Lord in what they are each asked to do, the entire body is taken care of. Somebody asked me, how are we going to fulfill the need of so many people that we have in our church, let alone those in the city we haven't reached yet? And the answer is possible. It's the entire church fulfilling its purpose here in Vancouver. It's not just one person. It's the entire church. If you have a need next to you, you're the person to fulfill that need. When all of us fulfill the needs of those next to us, every need is fulfilled, and God is receiving all the glory. Amen? So I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you this week to pray, to take this seriously, and whatever God is going to put on your heart, maybe it's going to be a number that you can't bring next Sunday, but I want to challenge you to commit to that number and say, God, I want to see you do this in our family, in my business, in my life, 
and in the next couple months, however long it takes to bring that amount to the Lord. We believe, I believe with all my heart, that we're not just going to finish the banquet hall. I keep saying this. We're going to pay our building off, and we're going to step into whatever God has for us next to do. Amen. Um, Before Alex takes stage to preach today, we're so excited. Um, I want to, for us to honor as a church, a couple people that are here. They're not guests. They're dear friends and family of ours. Pastor Anatoly is here from Mihailovka, Russia, with his wife, Lyudmila. If we could greet them, if you could stand, please, and you see them. He's got the cool earphones on. Um, But maybe just even a little bit uh, about them. They pastor a church in Mihailovka, Russia, called Church of Truth. We have another Church of Truth on the other side of the world. Um, But... I know uh, this. I know a part of this story when the, before the church started, and I wanted to share this. Just something that God put on my heart when I was thinking about coming up here. Pastor Sergey shared with me uh, and our team a while ago that in 1993, before uh, we actually started the church in September, just a month or two prior, uh, he goes on a trip to Russia with his father, their dad. They go on a trip to Russia to visit uh, Pastor Anatoly. When they go there. Uh, They end up uh, going to a service uh, that was happening there not far from their city. And when they're at this service, uh, the minister that was there uh, teaching and doing all the preaching that weekend, he pointed to our our pastor, Pastor Sergei, he pointed to him, 28 years old, he pointed to him, had him come to the front and begin to prophesy over him in front of everybody that was there along with some other people. He said things to him that nobody really knew except pastor knew things that God had, was doing in his heart those couple of years. And he said that he's going to start a new work through you in the city of Vancouver that you're from, wherever you're from. He's going to start a new work through you. And pastor, not knowing what he was meaning, he comes back to his seat, sits down next to his brother, and Pastor Anatoly tells him, well, Sir, Pastor Sergei leaned over, he said, what, is, what was he talking about? What do you think he meant? And Pastor Anatoly said, it's obvious. God's going to start a church through you. And you have to obey God. And since then till now, they have in Russia prayed for us, supported us, stood for us, interceded for us. And today this church is here and I'm so thankful for men like this, people like this, that can see what God is wanting to do and be obedient to God to do it. So we're so thankful that you're here with us today. And uh, if you understand Russian, if you don't, I'm so sorry, you're going to have to take some Russian classes. But if you understand Russian, at first service today, he preached such a powerful word that we needed to hear. It was such a blessing to us. Okay, well, that's enough. Can we stand to our feet, please? And we're so excited to hear the word of God today and what God has put on Alex's heart to share to the church, to preach to us. So please help me welcome him up as he takes stage. You want, you want the water stand? That's good. Good morning, church. Uh, Please be seated. Uh, thank you. Um, well, it's good to be here. I see some new faces, and uh, welcome. Uh, we are a church that believes in the movement of the Spirit, and we believe that the Bible, the Scriptures, is the authoritative Word of God. Um, and uh, the, we're going to be reading out of the Bible quite a lot today, and the reason that we trust the Bible is, well, it's multifold, but... It's a, actually a collection of reliable documents written across 1,500 years, three continents, three languages, uh, by different people, different genres, and it's all pointing towards the same thing, and the same thread is running towards all the scriptures, and they fulfill each other's prophecies, they predict things, and then things happen in human history, and all of this ties together. And for some reason, my Siri is trying to listen to me. All right, technology. Um, so... Every time I go into, you know, a new story in this collection of documents, it turns out to be deeper than you realize in the beginning. And the story we're going to be in today is no different. And so the more you dive into it, the deeper it gets. We're actually going to be in a book about a prophet. It's in the Old Testament. It's towards the end. It's one of the minor prophets. And it's very different than most other prophetic books. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, I'll give you a minute to get there. It's going to be the prophet Jonah, or the book of Jonah. Uh, The story of Jonah takes place in the 700s B.C., and commonly we know this story as Jonah and the whale. (laughs) Uh, Jonah and the whale. So I usually wake up around sunrise, 
Uh, not because I want to, but because my four-year-old Zeke decides that we want to. And so this morning, he, um, what I remember is, you know, being half awake and groggy. I, just this morning, he gave me the book of Jonah, I think. It ended up in my hands, and he's sitting next to me asking me to read it. And, I'm, and so I'm re- looking through it, and it's such a popular book for children, but if you notice, they always leave out some of the most important parts, uh, particularly in the end, and we'll talk about that as well. And so... It is a very popular children's story, and for good reason. I mean, wouldn't you want to sit down and have coffee with this guy and ask him what's going on? Like, how did you, this this guy, you know, survive three days in a fish and live to tell the tale? Like, you know, biggest missionary, we'll we'll get there. Anyways, it's not your typical prophet. So let's dive in and see what this book is about and why I think it matters so much. So chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. Now, I'm just going to pause a sec. When something starts off the word of the Lord, typically in the Old Testament, it actually is a way of introducing the prophet of God. And so this is someone who God speaks to directly and has a message for a people uh, from God. And God is calling out horrific wickedness in this city, and he intends for Jonah to go and basically, by the compassion and mercy of God, tell them. (laughs) Um, And so this isn't the first time Jonah's prophesying. It's not the first time he appears in the Old Testament, but this is the first time a prophecy has ever come to a Jewish prophet for another nation. Now, since the beginning, even before the law was laid down, God... God's heart was always to save all humanity, all the nations. And he intended to do this through Abram, and there's all sorts of history here. And so this is definitely in line with God's compassion and how he feels about every nation on earth. But for some reason, uh, this time it came to a Jewish prophet for another nation, and it was Jonah. So this doesn't normally happen. And so God tells him to go to Nineveh. Uh, Verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to get this flee from the Lord. Now, imagine it's your first time reading this, and maybe it is. You're like, you might be confused. (laughs) Didn't God just tell a prophet of God to go here, and where is he going? Uh, You you could imagine the first time encountering the story and wondering, what's what's happening here? This... These verses are definitely not what in theology you would call prescriptive. It's not prescribing a prophet to do this. In fact, if you asked me, Alex, can you recommend a book that would tell me how to not be a prophet? It would probably be this one. This is a very descriptive verse which describes what's actually happening rather than what we should be doing, right? If we could get, there it is. So just, just an idea, right? So, okay. So he is there. God asks him to go 550 miles northeast. Instead, he jumps on a ship and heads towards the south coast of Spain, which is interesting. Like, it's so much easier to go 550 miles than it is to try and go 2,500 miles. And honestly, we don't know how far he got. But I think the question here is, why is he running? Like, why? Um, One could think it's because Assyria is known for its brutality, and it is, historically speaking. so Assyria, Assyria is, is the country, the capital of Assyria is Nineveh. When we think of Nineveh as a city, sometimes we could think, you know, if we calculate the amount of people that were there, we can think, oh, this is kind of like Camus or something. But really, like, it's more like New York City. So think like big, populated, very advanced on every level. Their, their, their culture is so progressed on the theological, not theological, but like uh, the scientific side. And the problem is, how many of you know that knowledge doesn't lead us to morality. And so even though they are so advanced on every other level, humanly speaking, they are wicked and corrupt on the violent side beyond measure. Um, And Jonah's being asked to go to the capital city. And so, actually, fun fact, Nineveh was, people were doubting whether or not it ever existed um, until it was excavated in 1846. And then it was discovered, and it confirmed biblical kings and battles and all sorts of things. And this is very normal, by the way, for archaeology. It just discovers things that the Bible said. But the interesting thing about the Ninevites, maybe it's not as interesting, and cover your, eye, your ears if you have kids, but they would skin leaders alive of, like, of uh, you know, enemies that they would capture. They would do things like if you're, if you're a warrior and, and you got captured, you, sometimes you, they would parade you through the streets with the heads of your fellow warriors around your neck. There was stories about them making furniture out of their enemy's skin. Like these are not, 
this wouldn't be the New York City to visit. This would be something very different. And so their injustice and oppression is, is basically worthy of God's judgment and punishment, which has appointed them, but Jonah is given the opportunity to be a conduit for God's grace. And he's being asked to go into the capital city. And so some might think, okay, well, it's Nineveh. Maybe he's afraid for his life, right? And so let's dig deeper and see why he actually runs. Then the Lord, verse 4, Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Isn't it interesting that Jonah is the reluctant prophet of God who is sleeping in the storm while the pagan sailors are the ones that are recognizing that some divine work is at play and calling out to their gods. The irony in this story just gets better and better. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity, which was the way they made decisions. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Questions we'd all be asking in this case. He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This is the first time in the book that Jonah speaks. And it's interesting that the first time he speaks is an affirmation of his identity, of who he is, even though he's running from the Lord. The God who made the sea and the dry land, but you're running on the sea that God made from him. Incorrect motives and heart posture can often make us do irrational things, even if we're a prophet of God. Verse 10. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their, very, did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. So the storm is getting worse. It's raging, and they know it's because of Jonah. And Jonah could have been like, guys, just... Can, can you just get me out of here, get me to shore, like throw me something that floats, like let me get away from you if that's what's needed. No, he's, he's like, all right, just throw me over. It seems like he's given up all hope for his whole mission and even for himself. Even the sailors respect his life more than Jonah does. It seems like he wants to die. Verse 14, then they cried out to the Lord, please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you please. The pagan sailors see no other way out. It's either all of them die, or they basically let Jonah die. And Jonah's asking for it. So, at this point, the pagan sailors are calling out to the Lord, but the prophet won't. The contrast here, I hope you're seeing the contrast here. It's pretty astounding. Uh, we're going to go to verse 15. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. It's so interesting <laughs> Think about this. Jo God uses Jonah's disobedience to save pagan sailors. Even that God used for good. Uh, and then the next chapter, we're going to skip most of it, but we'll, let's, let's do verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now let's chat for a second. Some people will argue that Jonah as a story is actually more of a parable rather than history, and this is one of the reasons why. But some people find this a little fishy, right? Um, I have to. I'm a dad. I have to do that jokes. It was in the contract. Um, there's, there's some debate about whether or not this is meant as a parable or actual history. I think there's good reason to believe it is actual history for multiple reasons. We don't have to, time to get into, but the Hebrew does actually not say whale. But the Hebrew word there is actually some sort of large sea creature, or some could say large sea monster, depending on how you translate that. But for a God who created the universe, can we just acknowledge, for a God who created and spoke the universe into existence out of absolutely nothing, it is not very hard for him to keep a guy alive in a creature that he appointed for this for three days, right? So we already have that. Okay. 
Now, going to skip to chapter, chapter two, uh, most of chapter two to save time. It's actually Jonah's prayer from the in, inside of the sea creature. And it's actually very complex Hebrew poetry. It'll take time. But um, it's important here to notice that this is actually finally where Jonah actually prays to God. He was thrown off a ship, swallowed by the creature. Only then he decides to cry out to God. And the sea creature actually turned into the vehicle of God's grace. Jonah was ready to die. The sea creature rescued not just his body, but actually his soul as well. You see, he actually begins to acknowledge God and his call in his life and turns. Uh, verse 10. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. <laughs> Sorry, one more sidebar. Uh, well, there's probably going to be more than one. I'm not going to lie. Anyways, uh, Nineveh was a country that worshipped a god called Dagon. Um, and this god Dagon was a pagan deity who basically was like the god of the sea. And they believed all sorts of things. And an, like an ancient Babylonian historian writing around 400, so like maybe 300-ish years after Jonah, uh, he actually wrote something that looks, looks like Jonah, kind of. And, and he basically wrote about how the Ninevites believed that someone would come out of the sea and share knowledge with them, which is interesting. But as Jonah said before, God created the sea and the dry land, so he has power over it. And so could God have used Jonah in a way that Jonah wasn't even aware of? Maybe that's another reason why his message caught their attention so much. They're like, what? Um, and so I'm not sure, but God was definitely revealing himself. He was going through great lengths to show his compassion to the Ninevites and meeting them where they are. We're going to skip to chapter 3 now. You guys good? All right, so then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a, sec a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. What's his message? It's, it's literally what's going to happen, right? Right? It's, it's, uh, it's uh, eight words, it's five words in Hebrew, it's very short, um, but it's interesting because it's, you think about, okay, what's missing? We're, this is all we're given. Typically when a prophetic word comes into a city or to a people or to a king, there's usually like, here's what you've been doing, here is the judgment for that, or if you turn, avoid judgment, and then there's usually like, here's what's going to happen, sometimes it's like, here's how I'm going to take you through it, here's how I'm going to restore you. There's usually more context to God calling people to repentance than just, you will be destroyed. And so it's interesting. It's almost like, it's almost like, uh, like there's no mention of the God who sent them. There's no message of the message. There's no mention of the message that God said, proclaim the message that I give you. And it's, you start asking, like, is this missing on purpose? Like, what's going on here? You know? It's almost like Jonah doesn't even want to get them saved. Like, where is the compassion on Jonah's part, or even the effort, <laughs> at least? Let's keep reading and see what the response was to this, uh, you know, five-word sermon. The Ninevites believed God. Oh, a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. That's how they would mourn and repent and change their mind. But the thing is, the king, according to this, didn't even personally hear Jonah. The word of Jonah basically like, got to him, and he took it seriously. Verse 7, this is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may... Re yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Okay, so this is basically the biggest revival in human history ever to happen. Um, Jonah turns out to be the most successful evangelist the world had ever seen. And uh, verse 10, <laughs> when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, they relented and did not bring on them, oh, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So, very successful mission trip, right? Jonah must be thrilled. Like, he just got used in this way by God to save an entire city. Like, this is something he could put on his, you know, Instagram bio or something. This is, like, something really, really big. And so, like, this is a historic event. No one's ever seen such a revival before, right? So, let's read and see how excited he is about this. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. 
and he became angry. Wait, what? Um, he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Here it is, the real reason why Jonah ran from the Lord. It wasn't fear. The guy tried to die on multiple occasions. He had a serious problem with God's compassion. I think he was more afraid of his enemies receiving forgiveness than he was of losing his very life. Jonah's problem with God was that he was too compassionate, too merciful, even though he just received mercy after openly defying a direct command from God over and over again. Here's the thing. He seems to be quoting God's self-introduction in in, uh, Exodus 34, where God introduces himself and he says, I am slow to anger, abounding in love, maintaining love to thousands, forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. And he seems to quote that as an insult to God for his compassion. Now, how does God respond to a disobedient, defiant, angry Jonah? Verse 4, but the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. He seems to have ignored God's question altogether. Um, There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. He's probably hoping, I'm guessing, that the city will repent of its repentance and continue its violence, and maybe God will rain down fire and brimstone and the city will be gone. Um, Or that God will still overthrow it, right? Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That word overthrown, the original language was, was not English or, or, or Greek. This was actually written in Hebrew. The word overthrown is hapak in Hebrew. And what that word means is actually a couple different meanings. It could mean destruction, like Sodom and Gomorrah got hapak. Or it could mean repentance or turning. And both of those words, um, or that word means the same thing. And as far as we are aware in the context, the word Jonah used ref- was that word. It basically means repentance or destruction. And so regardless, the prophecy still got fulfilled. In a way, you could say maybe he was walking through that town and basically already prophesying um, that the compassion of God would actually save them. Now watch God's approach as Jonah sits there, angry, livid at God, just, you know, upset that his uh, ministry worked. Uh, Verse 6. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? That's it. That's, That's literally how the story ends. We could all start wondering, wait, like, what happens? Does, does Jonah talk to God more? Does he, is he still angry? Like, does he relent? Does God, you know, does God change his heart somehow? Um, you know, did, did he continue arguing for a while? But the thing is, Jonah, this book wasn't written for Jonah to understand something. It was written for you and for me. And so the question is, how do we respond to something like this? And so I have three main takeaways, and then I'm going to be done. Um, But I just want to note here that this is a story of a disobedient prophet and a compassionate God. So my first point is, am I running from the call? Um, Jonah had a hard time with submitting his heart to God's call because of the brokenness inside. Uh, Jonah's dislike of Nineveh actually got in the way of him accomplishing God's destiny, purpose, and call. And so what if God asked me to preach or serve or love someone who I don't really like or someone who maybe I disagree with politically or someone I think is too far gone, someone I have a hard time talking to, someone I don't respect, someone who hurt me? What would my heart response be? See, God doesn't always call us into something that we want in the moment. Sometimes we're asked to trust him and see how he takes us through. When Jonah ran... In his case, he wasn't running, he was actually running both from 
the people that God wanted to save through him, but he was also running from the pursuit and loving embrace of the God who was chasing him the whole time. Getting thrown into the water, he must have thought everything was over. My ministry, my life, it's, it's done. But God provided a large fish. He wouldn't let him fail like that. And if you've been running a long time, he still calls you today. Even though Jonah ran the opposite direction, maybe you're in here and you're thinking, gosh, everything I did was wrong. I, said, I shouldn't have said those things. I shouldn't have done those things. People, you know, I, maybe I hurt someone or someone hurt me. I, I've never forgiven someone. Um, or, you know, I should have stayed away from certain things. Look, this is a story of a pursuing God who uses a deeply broken prophet to save an entire nation. Jonah disobeys a direct command from God. God still takes Jonah, rescues him from certain death, puts him on solid ground, and saves an entire city from destruction through him. Then approaches him. To get this, he approaches Jonah with his unfailing love after Jonah's not satisfied. You feel inadequate to make a difference? You think God needs you to be flawless before he can ever do anything through you or use you? Very often in the Bible, God uses people after they messed up big. Abraham, David, Peter, denying Jesus three times, running away, Paul, persecuting the church. God uses your failures and mistakes as well. Once acknowledgement and repentance happens, he draws you in, transforms you, and then he empowers you. If, the, if you love God and are called according to his purpose, Jonah, stop running and trust me. I have an assignment. I will empower you. Are you a Jonah here today? Maybe you're inside of a fish of your own and it seems like everything is hopeless. You're put in a position where there's nowhere you can go. Maybe that fish is actually the grace of God rescuing you, body and soul, just like it did for Jonah. And you're actually in a perfect place to cry out to God. Author and philosopher uh, Clive Staples Lewis said this, We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Even in the storm, God prepared a fish for Jonah. He couldn't outrun him. He couldn't outrun his compassion and his grace. He had a way out for Jonah, and Jonah got to be very intimate with the Lord there. It was an opportunity for him for, to, for the first time, finally surrender to God. There's a missionary, Elizabeth Elliot. Her story is incredible, um, but this is what she said. A whole lot of what we call struggling is simply delayed obedience, or sometimes that could be easily called disobedience. But sometimes it looks intimidating, right? It can look like Nineveh. Like, we, we don't always know what the outcome will be, Going to Nineveh wasn't safe for Jonah, right? But even though going to Nineveh wasn't safe for Jonah, it was far more dangerous for him to be running from God's call from Nineveh. At least in Nineveh, he was in, 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 the, in the will of God, in the presence of God, in the purposes of God. Over there, he was defiantly and disobediently running. And so, and maybe God is providing a fish to slow one of, some of us down today and because he loves us. Is there an area of my life where I'm heading to Tarshish? Do I need to stop running? Sometimes following Jesus involves letting go of what I think ne things need to look like, my perception, my plan. Sometimes, God, how many of you guys know, sometimes God comes in and he says, actually, yeah, your plan, um, here's a better one. It doesn't look like it right now, but it's better. And we're kind of like, oh, all right, well, Jesus, you're Lord. <laughs> and you, you either, you, either you, know, receive the plan or you run to Tarshish. And so God's plan for us is actually much, much better. And the thing is, because Jonah didn't acknowledge that, even after his successful mission trip, his heart wasn't there. He was missing out on the celebration, the joy. The, the, imagine how much, you know, the party that he was invited to, that a city had been saved. He could have shared all of that with God who was still pursuing him, but his heart wasn't in the right place. What's better, faithfulness or success, if you had to choose one? Well, Jonah was very successful in his ministry, but he wasn't very faithful. And so if you had to choose, I think faithfulness would matter a lot more because what could you gain by gaining the whole world if you're losing your very soul? And so the reminder is, am I running from God's call about something in my life? Here's an interesting theory. The book doesn't actually attribute an author itself. Jewish and, um, Jewish and Christian theologians tend to acknowledge Jonah as the author. 
uh, some would say, at the very least, someone who Jonah know, knew very closely. Why? Because the, you know, the details are very, very specific, and the prayer in the fish is very specific. So um, my training in ancient Near East literature is still entry level, but I can confidently tell you guys it was not the fish who wrote it, so it was probably Jonah himself. Um, and so it's not in the Bible, but think about it. If Jonah wrote this letter or this, this story, could it be that Jonah actually did end up responding to the compassion of God? Because here is a hard-hearted prophet who is very livid about the success that God has granted him in his missionary journey, but then he ends up writing about it and putting himself in a very bad light, by the way. Maybe his heart did change, and he was changed enough to not be ashamed of the mistakes that he'd make, but rather to approach his mistakes from the grace, from the perspective of the salvation and grace and compassion of the God who was guiding him through. And he told the story to, and put himself into a negative light. Regardless, I don't know, but am I running for God's call, from God's call? I know this isn't probably not for all of us, but I feel like there's some people here that might be running from the call of God on their life that they're, they're familiar with and they're aware of, and maybe you're putting it off, and perhaps the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart and telling you it's time. Number two, am I running from God's compassion towards others? Am I running from God's compassion towards others? Jonah, the man of God, is angry at God for being too merciful and compassionate. An important note I want to make before I move on to my last point is we must be very, very careful how we treat those around us whom God is calling us to show compassion to. It can be very easy to forget that we need God's mercy just as much as anyone else. And if we aren't careful, we can fall into the trap of being a Jonah. While God is sharing his compassion and his grace and mercy with us, we have a problem, we can have a problem sharing it with others around us. Think about it. The story actually paints the Ninevite king and the people of Nineveh in a better light than the prophet of God himself. It paints the sailors in a better light than the prophet of God himself. The sailors respect Jonah's life more than he does. The sailors recognize the divine in the storm and actually respond where Jonah's sleeping. Couldn't care less. The sailors repent and turn to God. The king repents and changes his ways and saves entire people from death, basically. While Jonah would rather die than be obedient to the mercy of God. He didn't think they were worthy of compassion. He didn't agree with God's moral call on that city. Even though he's been receiving God's mercy and compassion the entire time, Jonah runs from God. God gives him grace. Jonah is angry at God showing grace to others. The really ironic thing here is that the story is, in this story, the prophet of God is the number one most hard-hearted person. And if we aren't careful, what, I, what I'm suggesting is that can happen to us as well. God is compassionate towards me. He's also compassionate to someone that maybe I don't like. Do I have someone in my life that I think maybe doesn't deserve God's compassion? If I don't think that and I won't say that, maybe I act like it. Maybe I'm like, ah, they're going to get what's coming to them. Good for them. They deserved that. You know, um, Jonah struggled with God's mercy towards others. So the question for some of us today is, do I? Here's the thing. As I continue to grow in my understanding and what God did for me through Christ, it becomes increasingly impossible for me to look down at others who have not yet received that same grace. Show me a self-righteous Christian that thinks they're better than everyone else, and I'll show you someone who still needs to encounter the compassion of God. We are all in need. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all need a Savior. We're no better apart from what Christ did for us. He moved towards us in his compassion, and he's inviting us to share that compassion with those around us. So maybe you're a Jonah in, in this way today, and you're struggling looking at someone and seeing the compassion of God for them. This could be someone, again, that hurt you. This could be someone that you still need to forgive. This could be someone that you just don't like. You don't get along with that work. X, Y, Z, fill in the blank. God's compassion for Nineveh is God's compassion for that person, and you might be the Jonah. Maybe you're lacking love for that person, and you need the Spirit of God to reignite and revisit that compassion that he has for you. You're invited to surrender your desires and on his, find his better ones on the other side. Join the celebration that jo Jonah forgot, or not forgot, join the celebration that Jonah failed to join and celebrate God's salvation through you for someone else. Dive deeper into realizing the compassion he showed you so that you can reflect it to those around you, right? 
So maybe you're realizing you're actually in need of saving. Maybe you're kind of like the Nineveh. Maybe it's been a while and you're running from God. Maybe you've done a lot of things that you wish you didn't do. And I just want to remind you as well, this book is soaked with the compassion and mercy of a pursuing God who is like relentless at pursuing people that need him with his grace. So the third and final question I'm going to have is, am I running from God? Am I running from God? Uh, I'm going to go to Matthew 12 very, very shortly. Um, And this is something that people typically call the sign of Jonah. And this is Jesus' conversation, or the conversation between Jesus and the religious elites of the day. And what just happened is Jesus heals someone who's demon-possessed. Everyone's like, whoa. And then these scribes and Pharisees come, the religious top-of-the-notch people, you know, for their, for their religion. And he, they, they come, and he's, and he's reading, the, like, they're thinking things, and it says Jesus knew their thoughts. He's responding to them, to their thoughts. And after all of this, they're like, show us a sign, man. Like, come on, prove it. And so this is what Jesus says. Then, then some of the scribes, this is Matthew 12, 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees told Jesus, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he replied to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves a sign. Yet no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Because just as Jonah has been in the stomach of the sea creature for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment and condemn the people living today because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. But look, something greater than Jonah is here. He's basically telling the people that everyone looks up to for being the most holy, that, hey, you know Nineveh, the wicked city, the violent city? They're going to be the ones that condemn you guys because they actually repented. But right now, someone greater than Jonah is here. There's a time where Jesus falls asleep in a storm as well. In Jonah's boat, everyone calls to their gods. And when this happened to Jesus, he calmed the storm himself. In the boat, they're asking, Jonah, who are you? Where are you from? What's going on? How did this, how, how, why did this happen? And then for Jesus, he calms the storm and they ask, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Jonah disobeyed and ran from God. Jesus obeyed to, due to the joy set before him, which was everyone in this room. He endured the cross, despising its shame and sat down at the right hand of God. Jonah was sent, God was sending Jonah as the mercy to, to sending Jonah the mercy, which is basically like the mercy of God to Nineveh. Well, Jesus is the mercy of God to humanity and to us. Jonah would rather die than love his enemies. Jesus defeated death itself because of his great love for you, who were you and I, who were his enemies. Jesus was what Jonah never could have been. Jonah was guilty and got saved by the fish. Jesus had no guilt, but he took mine and yours. Jonah was going to be the sacrifice so that the sailors could live. Jesus was the sacrifice, and it grants us today eternal life. Jonah didn't run on my behalf, and so now I don't have to. Are you running? Maybe there's someone in here today and they're running. It was the grace of God that chased Jonah down. The grace of God that provided a fish. The grace of God that saved Nineveh. The grace of God that is pursuing you and I today. Jonah was being asked to risk his life in order that Nineveh would be saved. Jesus willingly gave his life so that you and I might be saved. And if if you're in here and you're the person I'm talking to, maybe you're watching online... A decision will be made today. Once you leave this building or turn your TV off, the decision will be made today. Either you're going to keep running or you're going to not keep running. But you will be make, you're making your decision. What Nineveh did was repent and receive God's mercy. We're going to go into prayer in a minute. Can we stand? Maybe you're in this room or watching online and you're realizing that you might be the Nineveh. Maybe you feel like you're not worthy. Here's a secret. None of us were. No one is. And that's why it's a free gift. Maybe you're, you know, maybe you're realizing some of the brokenness in your life or past failures or mistakes. And you know, you know that you need the greater Jonah because today someone greater than Jonah is here in this place. God created humanity. Humanity sinned and rebelled against a good, holy, and perfect God. The very standard for goodness itself. And this caused destruction, disease, and and disease that, you know, like physical and spiritual disease that went all over the world. Sin and rebellion 
broke out, ruining our relationship with one another and with God. It fostered evil. And any sin committed against an infinitely perfect and holy God is worthy of death. Because a perfect and holy God must uphold perfect justice as well, otherwise he wouldn't be perfect. And so like the Ninevite king, see, like seeing that his people are going to, to, to be judged, he took off his royal robes, Jesus took off his royal robes, and stepped into human history. The author of human life and goodness itself writes himself into our story, lives among us, lives a perfect life on my behalf, dies the death that I deserved, and resurrects on the third day for my justification. He pays the penalty that my sin deserved, and by his resurrection, he showed that I am accepted, I am loved, I am redeemed, and I am given eternal life. What happens with the resurrection is that we are proved to be right standing before the Father, not because we deserved it, but because he did, and because he paid an internal bill against an eternal God that we would have never been able to cover ourselves. And he gave me a new heart. He didn't just come into it. He gave me a new heart. He gave me new desires, renewed, put a right spirit within me, freed me from the chains and addictions and everything that I could have been a part of, complete reconciliation, forgiveness for my sins, eternal life, salvation, and oneness with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. He gave me identity, purpose, and a call on my life. And this is a free gift, and it's being offered to anyone who doesn't have it today. That's the gospel. That's the truth of Christianity. And the choice is left to you. That's it. You could walk out of here very easily if this is you, and it's, that you would have made your decision. The sailors believed God could save them. That's faith. But they changed their mind, and they repented. That's repentance, right? They changed their mind. Repentance and faith is the process by which I receive the grace of God. And so, you place your trust in Jesus, in terms of, I trust that you have covered my eternal debt, and I am forgiven and free, and then I place my repentance, I turn from what I'm doing that is not of Jesus, and I start following him as my Lord. So when the sailors were telling Jonah to call out to God, remember what they said, they're like, maybe, maybe your God will hear. When the king of Nineveh ordered the evil to stop, he said, who knows? Maybe God will actually relent. Today, we can know for sure. You can know for sure. The price paid for you was not silver or gold. It was the precious blood of an eternal God who became man. Someone perfect, spotless, and blameless. And no other price will ever be able to compare for that, with that. Once you are his, nobody can bring a charge against you. It is not your behavior that justifies you before a holy God. It is his holiness and pure blood and sanctifying payment himself. And so no one can bring a charge against God's elect because it is God who justifies So Jonah wasn't perfect either, and no greater compassion exists than the one present in this room this morning. So why are you running? Today, someone greater than Jonah is here. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your grace, for your compassion. We're so thankful for the blood of Jesus on the cross, the sacrifice that was poured out for us. We're so thankful for the fact that you pursue us and pursue us with your love, relentless love and compassion. We're thankful, God, for the new, eternal, everlasting life you've granted us, for the fact that you freed us from our bondage and our chains, that you drew near to us when we were yet sinners. You died for us, Jesus, and you will never let us go. You are the author and finisher, the perfecter of our faith, and you take us from grace to grace, from glory to glory. God, I pray for each individual and each heart in this room. If they know that they are running from your call, Maybe they've been following you for a while and they sense, they sense by the Spirit that you're pulling them into a new season of their life. I pray that you would give them clarity, that you would give them more purpose, more meaning, and more direction. I pray that you would soften the hearts so that they can follow your call, whether they're believers or not, whether, they, you know, whether they've been following you for years or they never have before. I pray for each heart and each mind in this place. I pray for us as we encounter your compassion, encounter your grace, and encounter your love, God, that we would be able to show that compassion to those around us, God. I pray that you, you by your spirit, would soften our hearts and minds to be able to see your compassion to those around us who maybe we don't like. Maybe we think they're not worthy, but neither were we, God. Would you remind us of your compassion for us? And finally, God, I pray for every heart in this room that might not know that they are saved, might not know that you, Jesus, died on the cross for their sin in their place, and that today they're given, they're given and they're offered brand new life, free from addictions, bondages, and sin, free from the the free from the depravity that sin brought on all of us, free from shame, free from guilt, free from condemnation. God, I pray for those hearts, and I ask for you to soften them as well. 
whatever decision people make, God, I pray that you would draw them to you, draw them in repentance and faith so that they may receive and we can all celebrate together. Thank you, God, for your love and your compassion. Thank you for moving in this service. Thank you for the fact that we get to worship your holy name, that you get to we get to encounter you and that you know us and that you've drawn us near. Thank you for being a compassionate God and working through us, sometimes broken and imperfect people, to accomplish your greater purposes for your good, in your name and by your pleasure. In the name of Christ, if anything I said today resonates with you, you have any need, please do come forward. We'd love to pray with you. the morning uh, when we started the worship uh, God put on my heart thank you Alex what you shared is actually to release this word um, there's somebody in this place um, the, sh the season shift and God called you to something and you never done this before and you're afraid 
you're looking at yourself and you said, I, I'm not qualified, I never done this before. And the Holy Spirit actually wanna remind you, you're not the one who qualified yourself. He's the one qualifies you and he's the one called you. And let's look at him right now who create everything you see right there. He's the one qualified you. How dare you say, I'm not qualified. Don't look at yourself. Just look at the one qualified you. It's the Holy Spirit. And, and then when I was holding back, when Alex came out, it's powerful. It's in the same alignment that sometimes we're looking at self and like we're not qualified, but the Holy Spirit want to remind you right now that He is the one qualifies you. So we're going to continue in the worship and prayer. And I want to invite every one of you who's looking at, and you know the season shift for you. You know, and you are scared. You, you're looking at yourself. You're like, I'm not qualified. There's no way I can do this. Just come out. Let pray for you. People, the pastors and the people will come out and pray for you. Just, just uh, don't look at yourself. Look at the Holy Spirit who qualifies you. Thank you, Father, Lord. one who qualifies us the one who calls us God Lord thank you Jesus Lord I just want to pray for those who are standing in the position where they feel like they're not qualified father but you call them to qualify you qualify them father I thank you Lord for you call us yeah God Lord from nothing God we were once nothing we were in the deep darkness but you you paid the price you you done everything for us so we can be qualified in your God, Lord, in you, Lord, Father. And I pray that, God, Lord, if the fear is a tie, the people down, they standing in the fear right now, Father, there will be a, a breakthrough in there, God, Lord, and they will not look at themselves, but they look at the Lord who's qualified them. They will look at the Jesus who done, paid the price on the cross, who qualifies them. Father, I pray in those seasons, God, Lord, you will be the, the one encourage them to step out of that season of fear and just move forward, God, Lord, where you call them to be, God, Lord, because those seasons have shifted. You cannot stay in that season in the back because that's done. And God's called you for something greater. He prepared something greater for you. And you want you to follow him because you don't know what's await for you. But standing in the one place where you're at right now, it's not help you. You're not going to be, it's not better to stand it's better to follow the one who qualify you thank you jesus lord father we thank you lord for your cross thank you for the what you've done for us lord thank you jesus for this time and thank you for what you released the word from alex thank you lord because you know what the body needs and you release it thank you jesus lord
We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. If there's someone here in the sanctuary that made a decision to follow Jesus, somebody watching us online, we pray that you would write us, that you would let us know about your decision so that we can help you in your journey to follow Jesus and the next steps that you need to take. Father, we thank you right now for every person that has responded to what they heard. Right now in prayer to the message, we bless them in Jesus' name. We thank you, God, for your salvation in their life. We thank you for the calling upon their life. We thank you for what you're doing, Holy Spirit, in their life. We pray also for those that might be home, that might be watching us or here, that might be sick in any, any, any area of their body, might be recovering from something. I know Olya Zima is home from a surgery she just had. We bless her to recover and be healed in Jesus' name. Any other person recovering, any person walking through any form of sickness, pain in their body, in their bones, in their back, in any organ, in their head, we pray right now in Jesus' name for their healing. We thank you, Lord, that your word says by your stripes we are healed, that your blood speaks of our healing. Your blood speaks of our healing. And we, we agree and we believe, Lord, in this, in Jesus' name. And we thank you for recovery into every person, healing into every person. Those that might be sick with anything, we declare that sickness to flee and your healing power to touch them. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you, Lord, that you continue to heal and to save. And we bless every person in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Give God a mighty shout. We thank you, Lord. Amen. If I could make just a few quick announcements about our week, this Tuesday morning, we will have something. I know usually we don't have anything Tuesday morning, so please listen. Tuesday morning, we're going to have a memorial and burial service for our dear brother, Alexander Antipov. Um, for those of you that did not hear this week, he passed away. His passing was very quick, though he's been suffering for many years. And the Word of God tells us that we must walk worthy of the calling that we received. And this is a brother that our church can testify regarding that he lived worthy of the calling that he had received, suffering for so many years, but never complaining, never asking God why, but standing in faith firmly until the very end. Um, so we... We'll have his memorial service and burial service this Tuesday. It's going to be at Evergreen Memorial. I think they're going to put it on this. Oh, they did put it on. So it's going to be at Evergreen Memorial Gardens. All, everything is going to happen there. A quick service at 10 and then the burial following. If you're able to be there, it'd be uh, wonderful for you to be there. Tuesday night we have prayer. Friday night we have our Good Friday service. We'll be taking part in communion as a church and celebrating the price that Jesus paid that day for us. Also... Um, our team that's going to Alaska from our internship, we have a group of interns that's not able to go out of country. And so you send them to Alaska. We're sending them to Alaska, uh, to Nineveh. And that's probably probably more like Tarshish. But, but anyways, we're sending them there. They need to go there. And they are selling a bunch of stuff for their trip. And so if you can support them and visit them, that would be wonderful. Uh, God bless you. Have a great rest of your week. And we'll see you on Tuesday.